recordings. So uh, in the event you guys need to rewatch this later and or anybody uh, in your group is unable to to be here tonight, just let them know that this has been recorded and they can watch it at a later time. Um, the plan for this evening is that we've asked a few couples to join us um, because uh, one, we don't want these ideas to be all about Dave and Tammy, right? We really do believe that these are biblical principles and uh, there are other couples who um, have been implementing biblical uh, parenting principles for a while and um, and have had, you know, success. And so we want them to share with you guys as much as us. So sorry, what are you trying to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to introduce them really quickly. Um, I think most everybody knows Mike and Lisa Hurley. Um, mm -hmm. They have three daughters that are similar ages to ours. Um, one is now back in Washington, D.C. One's down in Austin and Jazz is still at home with you guys, yeah. right? That's yep. Right. Um, so they're joining us because they have much wisdom and experience. The Centellans, uh, actually, I shouldn't point because I don't know where they are on your screen. Um, Stephen and Kelly uh, are with us. Um, they have two kids doing a fantastic job with their kids, a boy and a girl. Uh, both Stephen and Kelly have jobs outside of their house. And so they are implementing principles um, with the time that God allots them. So they'll be here to talk about that we've got the ramirez's who no, honey. oh they're not sharing they're just joining sorry okay <laughs> and then the saliers who uh who are with us they have five children um they uh have the record i think for everybody on the phone call today um they get tired of these jokes i know it their oldest uh and their oldest is riley and then the next child down they're both uh baptized disciples which is really Exciting. And your guy's youngest is how old? She just turned seven. Seven. Okay. So that's the age range. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, two things. One, if you will do me a favor and make sure you mute yourself so that we don't pick up background noise. Um, number one. Number two, uh, we're going to go through first the questions that people have submitted. So if you have a question tonight, we may or may not get to it. Uh, it just depends on how quickly we can go through these. But if you just hover over your screen, you'll see a chat option down at the bottom. And um, if you will type your question into the chat, we'll try to get to it this evening. But if we don't, uh, because we run out of time, then we'll get back to you uh, over the next 24 to 48 hours. So we make sure we get everybody's questions okay. answered. So John. let's open up with a word of prayer and then we'll dive into our questions. Father, thank you so much for this time to gather. Thank you for everyone on this phone call that has sacrificed time this evening, uh, even at short notice, uh, to be with us and to just sit at your feet and gain your wisdom. We're so grateful that you give us guiding principles in the scriptures, and then you give us a community um, to help us not only mine those, um, but then to implement them in practical ways, just so grateful. I know most everyone uh, or everyone on this phone call desires to do well with their children. Um, we want to return our children back to you in the way that you want them returned back to you. We want to introduce you to them in the way you want to be introduced to them. So please uh, just give us wisdom. Please give us perseverance and strength, confidence, um, and, and this community to help us be successful. We love you. We're grateful. Please uh, just put your spirit uh, in us today so that yeah. he can speak through us uh, despite all of our inadequacies. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So first question. Uh, my child is in the zero to five range. Since I can't really draw out their heart at these ages, what should I focus on instead? Um, and Centellans, I have you guys uh, down for that one, if you are prepared to go. Uh, yes. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, we're the Centellan family. Um, so our youngest is seven, um, but we've been implementing um, these principles since our oldest was three months old. Um, so there's so much that you can focus on um, when your kids are zero to five year old that are going to greatly help you draw out their heart um, in their older years, um, working on things like first time obedience, um, identifying and talking through um, 
feelings at a base level, um, teaching and training during times of non-conflict and um, self-control training techniques. Um, some examples would be uh, like when I wanted my kids to focus all their energy and not go crazy, we'd fold our hands and ask them to get self-control. This was very useful, like in the grocery store. Um, so just working on some of those things um, is going to help a lot when they get older and you do start drawing out the heart. Um, we did blanket time and room time with our kids. We taught them how to sit in a confined space for a certain period of time and, you know, start out really, really small. Um, like Dave and Tam said, we both work outside the home. Our training times are like really, really short um, because that's all the time we've been allotted, um, but we do with what we can. So like just short little times, like started, started training them to sit still in one spot for like a minute at a time. Um, and then slowly increasing, increasing as time goes on. So um, really implementing some of those techniques are going to be really useful and kind of pave that way for when they get older. Um, if you send them to like self-reflective sit time, they need to sit and think. They already have those self-control skills that you've taught them beforehand. Yeah. So uh, just a couple things to add, um, you know, when they're little, it's also a great time to start teaching eye contact. So when you're talking with them and you're giving them instruction, make sure you're they're requiring eye contact. I know when our young, our oldest was little and we were in public and it's so many distractions, we would like put on blinders. Like you're looking at me um, just so that we have that contact and he, I know he's hearing us. Um, Oh, I had two more. The, the other one is, oh, yes, daddy and no mommy. So we, we taught them pretty early on. Yeah. Or just those type of responses, not okay, but yes, daddy, yes, mommy to clearly communicate. They're hearing us. They're, they're, they're acknowledging what you're saying. Um, and then there was one other thing that we, we worked on it because when your kids are little, you know, y'all play a lot of like, Oh, I'm going to get you kind of things. But my, our kids knew that when we said, come to mommy or come to daddy, it's not joking around. You need to immediately come to us right away and say, yes, mommy, yes, daddy. And, and that way they're not confused of like, I'm not chasing you to be silly. But when you hear these words, you know, I'm, I'm serious. You need to come here really quickly. And so that was very instrumental in knowing sort of splitting out the fun time versus the you need to obey this is the time to come so yeah am i muted no nope. and one oh. other thing i thought of that's helpful at this age too is just um baby signs as well so they can communicate if they want more if they're all done please thank you that was incredibly helpful too jack could model for us we've got to see him do that a couple weeks ago it was so cool <laughs> yeah he's Let's see if he'll do it. I don't know, but oh, yes. he only knows please. Or actually, he knows all done. All done. <laughs> He's been crying a little bit, so maybe later. <laughs> I walked. Uh, we, I walked by uh, Jack and his parents sitting at a table, and I see him, you know, asking for more food and please. And how old is Jack now? He's just one years, right? One yep. year old. He, he just, just turned. He just turned one. Yeah. <laughs> He's very confused by everybody. Can you say more? Can you say more, please? He goes like <laughs> this. That means more, please. Can you say more, please? When you're no, not fascinated by the phone. Anyway, <laughs> I... There it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. Good job. Now you get a snack. Yes. <laughs> the benefit, benefit to teaching... Um, uh, sign language is you are starting to teach like self-control, right? That they don't scream at you when they want something. Mm -hmm. Instead, they do a sign, which takes self-control to not, again, just verbally react, but they're actually doing a, a something else that you coach them to do instead of screaming at you. And by teaching them that tool, just think about what that's communicating to them as they get older that, oh, you know, there's other ways to um, express myself other than how I feel always. And uh, so anyway, sign language, uh, somebody taught us that and we taught our girls and it really did help. So like out in public at a restaurant, 
Um, oh, there he is, sign. Yeah, our kids would sign at the restaurant and again, instead of grunting or screaming at us. So yep. it was very helpful, but it does take a long time, like a lot of repetition, a lot of practice. Yep. So if you have more questions about that, you can reach out to us and we'll have you go over to Lisa's house. But anyway, okay. um, I did want to say one thing, uh, just to back um, what Stephen and Kelly were saying. There is a Bible study on our website called um, Biblical First Time or Biblical Obedience, Obedience. Mm -hmm. which, which teaches exactly what Stephen and Kelly were talking about. There's also a video on there of the Dela Cruz's uh, showing the right and wrong way to obey. And so you do not have to do it exactly the way our family did it. But when somebody did that lesson with me and then I just redid the lesson and I posted it online, it made sense. Like everything Stephen was talking about, things like making sure they're attentive. Often we just talk and talk and talk to our kids, even when they're young and we don't even know if they're paying attention. So um, another thing too, I just want to throw out there, when you give it your kid instructions and they're under the age of five, you can also say, repeat what I just said you know, and ask them to recall what you just said. And then you find out real quick if they really were listening. So anyway, on that document on our website, you can um, read all about all this. So if you have more questions, you can ask us. So moving okay. on. Question two, how can I encourage my four-year-old to stop antagonizing her older brother? It seems like she gets pleasure out of tormenting him. <laughs> uh, Santelins, you guys are back up again. Yes. Um so one of the things we taught our kids um, that we still use is um, in Proverbs 3, uh, Proverbs 30, uh, verse 32, it says, if you play the fool and exalt yourself, or if you plan evil, clap your hand over your mouth. So when my children are terrorizing each other, um, the offender gets to come sit by me with their hand over their mouth for a little bit um so that we can work through the situation um and when they're younger like four it just kind of gets them in the habit of oh i can't say unkind things um sorry i lost my spot um and this is a skill that we taught our kids again through a devotional in a time of non-conflict um if i was to just randomly tell my kids come sit over here with your hand over their mouth while they're upset it would not go well. So like we modeled what this looked like. Um, we did quite a bit of like role play with stuffed animals when they were zero to five as to like what some of these um, skills looked like and what they don't look like. Um, kids love both examples and non-examples. Um, but my other like follow-up questions this would be, I would also wanna know like, um, how does the older sibling react to the younger sibling doing this? Um, I know sometimes my kids will poke and prod at each other because they enjoy the reaction that they get from the other sibling. Um, and I would also ask just what is their sibling relationship like? Are they, do they generally get along or not um is the younger sibling feeling loved and included by the older sibling um just as a consideration because i know um in our family we have one that is much more vocal and will explode um when poked and prodded but then i have the other sibling that will silently instigate and we spent years thinking that the problem was the explosive one, just losing her temper um, because we weren't taking the time to fully like investigate the situation and realize the, the other one is trying to start stuff under the table where we're not going to notice. So just really um, taking the time to work through um, what's going on between the siblings. And again, um, the only reference I have was four-year-old and some sort of older brother. So I don't know the age difference or anything, but those were, those were my thoughts. Awesome. Thank you guys. Can I say something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that scripture that she shared, it was, is actually written to adults. So I heard a dad say once that he felt that was so disrespectful to have his kid put his hand over his mouth. And then I just reminded him, but that's actually written to us as adults. So I would even catch myself, you know, 
do you know what I'm saying? Like everybody get, you know, like that's not something just for kids. If we start to lose self-control, God actually encourages us. Just put your hand over your mouth. It's kind of like this reminder that should not be coming out. Yes. And we do it too. When I'm about to lose my patience with them, it's I'm going to go. Yeah. And it models for the kids that we're applying the scriptures to. These are not, again, just for them. I, I can't really think, I mean, I guess the obey your parents, but that can still apply to us too. So um, also uh, the Del Pinas, if you guys ever want to share something, I know I'm putting you on the spot. I forgot to prepare you. I mean, you're welcome to share too. Their kids are older and they taught these, you know, a lot of this material for years in the East region. So please feel free to just text me or raise your hand if you want to um, answer any of these questions. Okay. Can, I, can I add one other thing? Yeah. I think too, just like making sure that you're not giving your children too much freedom as well. Like making sure that you're not being reactive, but being really proactive as well. Like, you know, you're, it, it just might be too much freedom for them to spend like time together outside of your, like outside of you monitoring them. Sorry, I'm tired. Um, So, you know, I think just making sure that you're like, just setting them up for success, essentially, you know, not giving them too many freedoms and making sure that they have earned that freedom to play together individually or like um, outside of your like watchful eye and whatnot. Awesome, Bree. Thank you very much. That's a very good, good one. Okay. Question three, how do I create intentional training times when my child won't sit still? I think Lisa uh, volunteered for this one, if I got it right. Yep. Yes. Thanks, Dave. So I'm Lisa. And this is my husband, Mike. We live up in Frisco and um, we have three kids, uh, 22, I'm looking at him to make sure I get it right, 22, um, 19, and then 18. And so we sort of stumbled across these biblical principles and resources before we had our first one. Um, so we started there and then we got even more resources and training, I would say probably more structured training when we moved to Dallas and our children were about eight, uh, five, five, and, five and four, mm -hmm. five and four. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to share that because I know that different families have different amount of children. Some are infants and you're starting like, you know, if you like DIY, this is a new construction. And for some of y'all, it might feel like rehab, might be a little <laughs> rehab but it's not rehab where you're demolitioning the whole house, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, you may have multiple children where you're starting these uh, trainings on sitting still and, and so forth at different um, abilities to really understand morality. And we'll go more into that. So I just wanted to say that as a blanket statement that it's not rules, guys. That's not the point of the call, right? The point is to give you community but also to help you see how awesome and beautiful this can be if we train our minds and our spirits to look at the biblical holistic principles. So that's my spiel, but let me go into sit still real quick and I'm going to set a timer so I don't over talk because sometimes <laughs> I can do that and my husband will have to tap me on the leg, but here we go. So what I wanted to say specifically about if you're having trouble with your child sitting still so you can train and you feel overwhelmed, the Holy Spirit is the bomb because that means that that's what you need to focus on. He will always tell you exactly what you need to hone in on by what's going on in your house. So sitting still is the actual sort of skill and virtue for your concentration right now. And Rome was not built in a whole day, right? So your parenting and your skills will not be built in a day, in a year. Even in four years, it will take um, the whole, I guess, cycle of your, your training and growing of your children. But you start small. And so you start with some of the things that you heard some of the families like the Centellans talked about earlier with folding hands and blanket time. But if you have children who are maybe not infants or toddlers, they can talk. They're under five and they can reason. Maybe they're a little bit more... Um, cerebral and can interact with you, you can tell them exactly what you're doing. We're going to train to learn how to sit still. And you can in introduce these positive, beautiful things that you're going to do together to be a, a better family for God. 
And so I would even use um, games. If your children are uh, motion oriented and athletic, I would use yoga poses. Let's, let's use these as sort of fun goals and activities to learn stillness. Um, there's a scripture that I wanted to share with you that talks about how being still, it's a virtue. And so these aren't necessarily, you know, we're stopping you, which is how I grew up. I grew up being parented out of trauma and stress by a divorced mom just trying to feed me and make it. And so often the ideas that I have of sitting still and don't do this and don't do that comes from a mindset of negativity, but God reframes us from the scriptures by teaching us sit still so that you can hear from God, hear more. And you're just doing fun, interactive, age appropriate things to really help your child. So the training is actually sitting still. That's excellent. Excellent. That's so helpful. Um, keep... So question four uh, is sort of a tag on to this. So I just want to read it in case there's anything that you want to add. Um, but it says, I watched your mini video on self-control sit time, and I'm having a hard time feeling like making my child sit in total silence isn't somehow cruel. Uh, so um, say as much or as little as you want on that, Lisa, or I, I don't know if I think, oh, well, maybe you were just scratching your nose, Kelly, but um, <laughs> if somebody had something and then you wanted to say something on that. Okay. Sure. Um, and uh, Dave, just so that you know, I, I sent a bunch of notes. So you tell me when you want me to, um, you and Tammy can kind of tell me if you, if you want some feedback That's or whatever. Good. So I'm going to rely on you to kind of say, Hey, um, would you mind sharing? Because I don't want to overshare. I want sure. To yeah. And share as much as you want about what you share? wrote. It's just, it, it was similar to the last question. So yeah. I don't want to feel like you had to repeat if, if it wasn't sure. necessary. Well, I did want to share sort of a way of thinking that is super helpful for Mike and I, whenever we think about this huge task of like growing our kids, right? It could be very overwhelming. The thing that is so good to remind yourself is this question. What is the biblical goal of this training strategy I have in mind, right? So in this case, learning to be still, that helps me to sort of figure out how to ground my training in God's paths instead of some like a uh, human uh, strategy or some, you know, parenting hack, right? It's not a hack. We're trying to figure out how does this really align with the heart of God? And so I just wanted to share a little bit about how I grew to, or what I grew to understand about sitting still. It's very spiritual. Psalms 46, 10 says, be still and know that I am God. And so in my upbringing, I got timeouts or I got go over there and sit over there and think about what you're, you know, just a very um, stressed and negative way of, of chastising and correction. So I associated these ideas of go sit and think and timeouts with punishments, right? I, I didn't have training, so to speak, in that way. But training times for silence and stillness, it's not punishment. And it's definitely not what you're um, associating with, with the, what the world says timeout is. And if you're able to frame this strategy in like biblical wisdom, then it helps you to implement whatever you're going to do, whether it's sit still time or look me in the eye or whatever uh, modality, you are able to do it from a place of peace, like biblical godly peace, not your own peace and love and a right heart instead of any traumatic or negative or sinful associations. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, yeah. Just being able to reframe how you see the self-control might help you to not feel like, oh, I'm trying to gag my child and get them to not move. It's not solitary. Excellent. So um, I don't, I hope this isn't repeating in any way. I love the way you frame uh, that. So I don't want to take anything away from it at all. I almost want to just let it lie. Um, the only thing that's on my heart to add is I just think raising children is going to bring out of you some bad paradigms, right? So for example, when I was young, there was this mantra, children are to be seen or are to be heard or are to be seen, not heard right? Well, that's a, that's a cruel statement. 
But I understand where it was coming from in those parents. What the parents really wanted was obedient, respectful, thoughtful, kind, knowing how to interrupt. That's what they wanted, right? But but it got framed in this unkind phrase. And so when, when we're thinking, oh, if I'm going to have my child sit with their hands folded for five minutes, isn't that cruel? Um well, the question is, what's your goal? And I think Lisa just said it so great. I don't need to add to that, right? But the goal, there's so many scriptures on the importance of self-control. Not only that, when we get the Holy Spirit, it's a spirit of power and self-control, right? God wants us to have self-control. So how are you going to teach that to your child, right? So like Lisa said, if you can root these things in your long-term biblical goals, then the the training mechanisms are based in that. They're not based in cruelty. They're based in teaching. And so, I'll ahead. just add to that too. Um, I think two things. Number one, often as parents, you can just wait until they're teens and then you know talk to them about purity and somehow expect them to magically have self-control. But yet they never had to have self-control up until that point suddenly because then the sin delayed suddenly, yeah, delayed gratification, right? So um, just be aware that we're laying the foundation in, in your age group, you guys are, for what they'll be like as teens in processing life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I realized that and connected it, it really motivated me. But I do want to confess, when I first heard about training my kids in self-control sit time, I didn't do it for years. I, I, let's see, we started, I probably learned about it when Emily was three and she's age seven. I still had never taught them to learn how to get gain, I mean, I, they knew for some obedience and they had enough self-control to do that, but I had never really had them just sit and do nothing and be able to be attentive for a period of time long, you know, without entertainment. And, um, finally I was out at the grocery store and, uh, and I don't, Emily won't care. I share this, but she just always was loud and dancing down the aisles. It was like, she just became a different person when we left the house. She's very energetic, very wild. Uh, I know it's hard to believe if you know her now, but <laughs> And, or we're at the doctors and I'm always telling her, please be quiet, please be quiet, please be quiet. Um, and I, I stepped back and I listened to my, you know, I thought about how am I sounding? And I thought it's more cruel that I won't take the time to proactively train her how to have self-control in certain situations than me nagging at her all the time. I was constantly barking at her. And so I repented and like the next week, she's seven years old and I actually have a photo. I, uh, I, I told the girls, I said, you know what, guys, I'm going to give you the greatest gift ever. It's something I wish my parents had taught me and it's self-control. It's so beautiful. And we, um, I have how to do it on our website. So I'm not going to go into that, but there is a lesson on there that, and I just finally took the advice and did it. And oh my goodness, like within a week, I would go to the doctor's office and I told the kids, okay, when the doctor comes in, that's when we get up on the chairs and we're in self-control sit time. So I, mommy can hear the doctor talk. And so sure enough, the doctor walks in, my kids get off the floor from and let go of their toys, sit on the chair, fold their hands. The doctors thought they, uh, it, they'd never seen anything like it. That's not why you do it. But the point was the doctor felt, wow, they're so respectful. And I was like, well, we just worked on this, <laughs> but, um, but I just, yeah, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. anyway, I just wanted to show you, tell you that it's okay if you start late. And I was going to show you a cute little picture. That's Alex and Rachel. Can you see them with their timer? Oh, like oh yeah. The pads <laughs> yeah. So they, they have their little timers and all that's on the document. So if you have questions, just let us know. Okay. Number five, my wife spends more time with our children and does the majority of the training due to me working outside the home. How can I take an active part in my child or in my children's training? Uh, Mike, I've got you down here. If you're good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share uh, some of my thoughts on this topic. As a, a father who was working outside of the home and coming home to my, you know, young uh, girls, and they all run to the door excited that I'm there and ready to uh, have the evening with me. Uh, it is it is important for us as uh, the parent who may be outside of the home to have uh, intentional time with the kids. I think intentionality and consistency go a long way to demonstrate uh, your participation in your child's rearing and training, right? It's sometimes it's quality over quantity mm -hmm. that may speak clearer and longer, I think, to your children's hearts and souls 
uh, and also to your spouse. Uh, because sometimes uh, what is needed is presence in the lives of the kids, but also for our spouse to see that we are taking an active uh, place in the training, rearing, and uh, engagement of our children as well. That goes a long way for our marriages, for the peace in our homes, and it sets an environment for our kids to feel secure and safe and to uh, ingest the things that we are uh, pouring into them. So your partner may be you know, the main implementer uh, since they have more time You're with the, the kids. Manager. Yeah, they may be the floor manager, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, being, you know, having to be intentional and have that time with them regular. But we have to set regular time and expectations for our kids and to interact with them as well. So what, so they can anticipate, for me, in my case, time with dad. So we would do things together. Like I was responsible, I would say responsible, but there were certain things I did around the house. Like I would carry the kids up to the room. I would do the tuck-in time. Uh, I would do, you know, Lisa loves to do bedtime stories, but she allowed me the opportunity to uh, read bedtime stories to the kids. So that was a time of engagement that I had. That was a time for them to share with me what they were thinking, how their days went, what was on their hearts and minds, what they learned. I would always ask what they did that day and they would walk through that with me. So in uh, those times with us can create a strong sense of, of uh, leadership and partnership in the family so that your spouse knows that you're engaging in the rearing and training of the kid. I think that goes a long way. Yeah, the only thing I'll uh, say is just to share about me, and this may not apply to anyone else on this phone call, but um, I am clearly a product of our culture. And in our culture, it's really easy for dads to not take an active role in the, the spiritual, emotional, and virtue training of our children. Um, and I'll be honest, guys, I, I like my job. I liked going to work. I liked being the provider. And my culture gave me the excuse to pour myself into that and then be too busy to really uh, create training time with my kids. And that was rooted not only in laziness, not only in selfishness, but it was also rooted in insecurity because the truth is no one ever modeled for me how to train children. And so uh, although deep in my heart, I wanted to do better for my kids, I didn't know how to do better for my kids. So I just want to share that because I think this is one of those things where if, if you happen to be like me and you need some help as a father, like how do I as a father intentionally train my child will get some help but i promise you this as you start to do it and you start to build that kind of training relationship with your child beyond training them to change the oil and change a flat tire you know like when you start to train the morality of your child you your confidence will grow and you will start to love that role but satan doesn't want you to take that role Everything is against you. So that may not apply to you, but I just wanted to share it because it applied to me. And if you happen to be that guy, uh, don't live in shame. Just acknowledge that you're, you know, in the stream of culture and it's hard to get out and get some help. So anyways, Mike, thank you for sharing that. That was excellent. Hey, Dave, could I add to that? Absolutely. So um, I'll say, so Kelly works as well, but she's a teacher and the kids go to school with her. So she's around the kids a lot more than I am, and she knows what we need to be working on, and she usually initiates that a lot more. But us being on the same page, so I know what to reinforce and what to be on the lookout is also very important, just so we're on the same page of what we're communicating to the kids, what we're training and teaching the kids. So I, I would say very important just to communicate amongst the spouses, just to know um what's going on and, and what what even if a situation happens at school today kelly let me know so i could just ask questions if i see anything odd odd or different come up so that's great thank you very much um steven that was excellent sorry we lost our place for a yeah. second yeah oh so I want, um I'm, i want kelly to answer that kelly and steven so number six sorry i hit okay I so both of us parents work full-time 
when should we do non-conflict training? You guys touched on that a little bit before, yeah. but maybe you could just- Maybe a practical, like yeah. how do you do that? Because your kids, I don't know when you put them in preschool or I don't know, maybe you could share a little bit of when, when you were dealing with work, how did you train them? Um, so we would set aside like one night a week um, where we were just intentional on like, what do we- or we would pre-talk beforehand, like, what do we see um, in the kids that we think needs, we need to work on, or what's going to be best for our family, and then we would um, set aside some intentional time to work on those things. Um, I think when the kids were, like, younger, um, I did have the benefit of being a teacher, I'm, I'm able to very um, specifically with a lot of effort, not stay there forever, but get home at a reasonable hour. So like when the kids were little, we were like working on things like self-control time or blanket time or things like that. I would get home before him and I'd be able to work with the kids on that so that um, when he came home, there was a little more freedom to just play. Um, but I think, I mean, if you're two working parents, give yourself a lot of grace. You're not going to um, be able to train everything. Um, I kind of always thought of it kind of like a buffet. Like I can't eat everything all at once. And if I try, I'm going to uh, fail miserably. Um, but just going back and getting little bits at a time and um, just getting it in there where you can. Um, I know one thing that's special that me and the kids do in the morning on the way to school is we all take turns praying. And um, a lot of times we'll like, my, my older one is really into um, a podcast, uh, Science Plus God. So we'll like listen to that podcast together and we'll talk about what they talk about. So, I mean, and that's just, our, it's, it's our commute to school, um, but just being really intentional of finding where you can um, put those times um, is really important. I think communicating together once a week um, with your spouse, like, okay, what do we want to focus on? What do we want to train on? And when can we do that? So it's, it's a lot of intentionality. <laughs> Awesome. And the one other thing I'll just add is um, car times. I mean, I know we're dealing with younger kids, zero to five in this age range, but as they get older, like the, the two to five year old um, prepping for wherever you're going. So if you're going to church and you want them to um, say hi um, to three people or whatever it is, just explain, here's where we're going. Here's some things we can work on and just prepping them for where we're going, whether it's going to grandparents. Hey, I know we're going to grandparents. If, if, before you eat any candy or anything sweet, make sure you check with mommy and daddy, you know, stuff like that. Just prepping them for wherever we're going. So they know what the expectation is. They know what they're walking into and they're not just blindsided by what's going on at that location. Mm -hmm. That's priceless, Stephen, by the way. Priceless advice. Five second thought. Um, yeah. Being very mindful um, in your environment, especially with your infants and toddlers. Um, not their exposure to media necessarily, but your exposure to the um, type of sounds and the type of like uh, loudness. I, I know that might not even sound related to spiritual training, but I think that if you can be mindful of the things that you're listening to while in the car, this talks about being busy and working, right? Um, you can use those times to play spiritual things or to play things that are beautiful, right? Or things that are meaningful on the, the television screen that even though they're not ready for the moral training, you are um, putting good and you can feel good that you are giving what the Bible says, think of noble and beautiful things and peaceful things to your babies now. It That's took excellent. me a while to get Tammy to give up her Led Zeppelin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Mike, this one is a little bit like what we talked about before. So if you yeah. have something to add to it, feel free. If um, if not, that's fine too. Um, I just don't want to make you repeat if you didn't have anything. But yeah. it says, when my mm -hmm. husband returns from work, 
He just wants to have fun with the kids and isn't interested in training or disciplining with the little time he has. How do we balance our time training with having fun and building memories with them? Yeah. Now, I know Lisa has some um, definite thoughts that she would probably want to share on this topic. I want to just share with the group a thought, uh, and it ties into what Dave was saying earlier. We've This is a, a question where we have to really be cognizant of the influence of the world and our environments on us as parents and as a married couple. This is where sitcoms and TV shows and now social media can create images that we don't understand are driving our behaviors and therefore creating dissatisfaction in our emotions. What do I mean by that? We see, a. let me just give you guys this image. Spouse walks into the house after a long day's work. Spouse who's been in in the house, in the house with a long day's work, just hands them the kid, right? Have you guys ever seen that in the media? Oh, yeah. It's like, okay, you take these kids. I've been with them all day. So there are these uh, pockets of popular thought. Oh, you know, I, you know, I spend so much time with the kids. I'm so run down. I'm so burnt out. There's an aspect of that that is valuable uh, that has to be respected. What I'm talking about is the influence of the world. So it's very important for us as couples to communicate openly and clearly on what we need help with. We need to be asking the spouse who's with the kids each day, hey, honey, how can I support you when I get home? What can I do that would give you, uh, would add value or give you real relief? Instead of coming in and then the husband doesn't ask or the person that's been outside of the home doesn't ask. So the person who's been in the home automatically just starts, well, you need to change the kids, baby. You're going to feed them tonight. You're going to stay up all night. And you get into these mm -hmm. arguments, not realizing that we could have avoided that just through clear communication. So uh, obviously the question is about one spouse coming home and wants to just play and have fun uh, with the kids. But I think part of it, if you parse it out, is because we're not communicating clearly and getting on the same page about what's needed in the family. At least you have something. I'll add real brief. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the busier financial provider feels guilty for not getting to spend um, a lot of the physical time with your children, right? So you can view playtime or fun um, it feels like maybe the more loving way to bond and biblical training can sometimes you, you can think in comparison to fun and um, and playtime that it's um, not even necessarily boring, but just the harder way. And so I think um, it's a mind change. Again, you we, we don't want to parent through guilt. We've all done it. We don't want to parent through um or, or even inter, interrelate with each other through guilt either. So biblical training, it can be very bonding if you view it not as a hardship, but more like this is doing life together. It is playing and singing and doing chores together yeah. and working and going for walks. And so reframing, I keep saying that phrase, but reframing that biblical training as doing life helps you not to see it as like a grind or a, you know, grunting through things. Mm -hmm. And Deuteronomy 6 says that we should um, repeat godly principles in our family and to our kids as we sit, as we walk, as we go about. And so it's it's really a lifestyle. Uh, so the spouse that's coming in feeling like they need to make up some kind of time by having fun with the kids. Um it's going to be fun to have kids that understand the, the, the beautiful way that God has laid out for us. That's what's going to be fun. Uh, it's not going to be fun to have played with our kids to get them to like us when they're young. And then when they're old, as Tammy mentioned a moment ago, they don't know virtues of self-control. And therefore, they are uh, acting out in school or whenever uh, uh, they're interacting with others and with you. And then you're having a difficult time. Uh, trying to interact with them or to get them to um, follow God's principles. So this is an investment for us yeah. uh, as families. And I think that investment will go a long way if we 
allow the biblical principles to uh, to really to serve us. Amen. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, number eight. How can I start teaching the moral reason why at these ages? And I hate to keep dumping on you guys, but Lisa, I have you down for this one. I don't mind, but I, I just want you to, guys to understand. Uh, I've, I've done it, but I'm still learning. Like, I'm going to be in the adult class after this, right? <laughs> and you're just recycling. <laughs> So anyway, I just wanted to share the things that, you know, we were able to benefit from that somebody gracious and loving enough, aka the Retairs and the Della Pinas and a whole bunch of folks, they they invested in us. So that's all we're doing here. But okay, um, the moral reason why, right? From zero to five. So you should maybe get an idea by now. Typically three-year-olds and under, they're not capable Maybe if you have a genius, you know, Jack is probably a genius, <laughs> but not completely capable of learning morality and the reasons why we do what we do. And so you guys, you're focused more on the physical and behavioral training, right? So y'all are in like, you know, the trenches right now. And that's why you guys are so tired. And that's why we do things after bedtime, because we know, you know, you're in it um, all day. So the trainings of behavior like sitting still and good manners and um, spiritual awareness through singing and reciting things and rituals and routines that will elevate and promote godliness and godly behaviors and ideas. That's what you're, you're in it. And so in one sense, it's slightly less mind work for you because you're about physical and behavioral modeling but it's exhausting, right? It's worth it though. Now later when they're better equipped to understand their heart and they have words and language to communicate, um, they can understand the preciousness of God and the preciousness of others. And so that's four, maybe three. It just depends on each, each child, right? Um, but that's when that starts. And in, in the early years with mine, I tried to filter most of my behavior type training and then later the moral training through two principles. I can't do complicated. I get very overwhelmed with a lot of content. So the two things that I did to keep it simple after I had my growing kids God's way class and mm -hmm. I would get with Mike and, you know, have a cry about how I'm just not doing well. I would say, <laughs> okay, all I got to do this week is teach the girls. God loves me and God loves you. That's the first principle. And the second one is God wants me and you to love others. And if I could filter everything I thought about doing that week through those two things, yay, I felt like it was a glory to God. Mm -hmm. So there's that. I hope that helps. Yeah. Excellent. And not only does that help, but you've just paraphrased exactly what Jesus said, right? The first commandment, Love the Lord, you got with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. The second, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, all the laws, I forget how it's phrased, but all the law is summed up in these two. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, as you teach your children that, and just to summarize this really quickly, right, somewhere around four or five years old, your kids start comprehending the impact that their decisions have on others. But the way that they first understand that is when they understand that they wouldn't like being treated that way, right? So that's your first sort of transition. But then there's, an, even after they start being motivated by the impact their decisions have on other people, there's another transition, which is around eight-ish when they start connecting with why they're doing what they're doing right? There's like these constant transitions. So we're always encouraging parents to try to start incorporating these teachings before you hit the transition. So we encourage parents start adding the moral reason why at age three. Are they going to get it? Probably not, but you're practicing it, right? And you never know when the light switch is going to come on, you know? So anyway, don't want to, Lisa is so good at answering these. I don't want to belabor the point, but um there was a question about how do I teach my child to obey, but because we're trying to get through another two questions, I'm just going to say this. There is a, uh, an, oh, it, Tammy, I think mentioned it already. It's just called biblical obedience and it's how to teach your child to obey. Mm -hmm. It's on the website in the resources page. So I'm just going to 
leave that and move on to question 10, which is what do I do if we end up having conflict during our times of non-conflict training? <laughs> so, and, uh, yeah. Too often. Should we recount how many times this has happened? I mean, yeah. it happens well, a lot. Yeah, so to clarify the question, especially if you don't use that word non-conflict, I know we taught that back in lesson two, but again, we're supposed to be proactively having times with our kids, very short um, times where we're training a virtue and we want to do it in non-conflict, which means not when they're in trouble. So it's a time of being proactive and teaching six. Yep. Deuteronomy six. Yeah. So um, I was going to have the sal saliers have a turn because they, um, you know, are, aren't tired at all after their third call today. <laughs> Um, but if you guys could share a little bit, especially, um, you know, you do, you have five kids. And so I'm sure it even gets challenging training one while another kid's doing something else that maybe is distracting. So could you guys share a little bit about what you do when they are. When you're you, training, you're in a training, you're training time of training. conflict and their conflict arises. Yeah. That's, that's never well, happens. Yeah. Like that really said that. I can't, I can't even count the number of times that this is, uh, yeah, this is a common scenario in our home, to say the least. Um, so, uh, so yeah, do you want to start? Do you want me to? Go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, I think, you know, it's, um, yeah, and I can't tell you how many times I used to lament to Tammy when, like, one thing would then turn into, like, three things, and then I felt, like, so overwhelmed. Like, where do I even start now? I feel like, we were we start, set out working on this, and now I've got these other issues that have now since arisen. You know, since we started. So, so yeah. I mean, essentially, if you're going to do any kind of training, they have to have you know be in a place to really be receptive to your training and to essentially have like a teachable heart. So if they're not, yeah, giving you their undivided attention, if they're throwing a fit, they're um uh, let me give another example of the stage um. Yeah, essentially just being non-compliant, you know, not being willing to do what you're asking of them, then oftentimes you, um, see, it's hard. I, I, I feel like zero to five is such a big gap. So um, when they're really little, I, I wish I knew how, how old, I feel like most uh, kids on this call are younger, I would say. So um, yeah, I think you can always use isolation, you know, like when, when we're talking about little, like, um, you know, from... Uh, I don't know, uh, 12 months up to, you know, two or three, um, you know, you, if you have like a pack and play that you can put them in um, and then once they, yeah, and then you can bring them back to what you originally, you know, had set out to, uh, to do with them or if they're older, they're walking, they're more uh, verbal, you can ask them to go sit on their bed um, and do so, you know, and um, we used to always just say happy heart and we would do this oftentimes when they were little um, that, you know, cued them to, you know, just, yeah, that they needed to, um, you know, just to, yeah, essentially have a happy heart when, with, with, with whatever I was asking them to do. Um, I don't know if any of this is making sense. Do you want to add anything to this? <laughs> yeah, I, think, um, I think one point was, I know Brie was always good about trying to make sure the non-conflict time was when they were well-rested, yeah, well-fed, um, and, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't up super late the night before. They're not sick. You know, obviously you take all those things into consideration when you're, you know, planning times of training. Um, and maybe it's just like today's not the, you know, maybe we're going to move it to tomorrow because mm -hmm. it's just not the day to do it. Uh, so I know that's, that was important. Yeah, that's a good point. Like Thursday mornings were always really challenging after being out late for church on Wednesday evenings. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah and I think too, just making sure that you're in a good place as well. Like, they, and you really are just positive, like, and really just like what Tammy had spoken to you, like just really speaking a lot of life into like, you know, like if you're teaching them self-control, like this is such a great skill to have. And you're going to be so blessed to like have this skill as you get older, depending on how verbal they are and how much they can understand, but just really being like positive about it, you know, and not just like, yeah, begrudgingly going through it or getting frazzled or frustrated with them um yeah and you can always revisit it but yeah that, that's a good point we we oftentimes if, if time allowed and if you're not rushing out the door just doing it first thing after breakfast you know and it doesn't have to be long either you know you can just take a few minutes each day and then just really think like lisa uh, has touched on this a few times like really just focusing on one thing at a time and not overwhelming yourself yeah and then just i think it's been said a couple different times by um the by Mike and Stephen is is um, just that 
the communication between the spouses just so like if Bree's been working on you know something with the kids and then I come home like I'm, I'm I know what she's been working on if I see it I can you know praise our kids for it and really encourage them and that we're on the same page and or if I'm with them spending time with them I can also you know work on things as well so that's that's very important Excellent. Thank you, guys. And I, I think prioritizing, sorry, and then I think prioritizing, um, teaching them obedience and self-control, which will then in turn really help with um, with, with training all these other areas, you know, because if they, if they can't, if they don't have those, you know, two, um, two things, it's going to be very difficult to train in other areas. Right. right. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to um, try to get one more question real quick, and then I want to let you guys as close go as close to on time as possible. Just want to make sure we touch on this. Um, how do we help our children get along when they have different temperaments or personalities? Anybody? So we do have Lisa. Anyone mm -hmm. else? Lisa, can you know, we can share again, but the, the Hurleys are welcome too as well. Holly, did you want to, did you raise your hand too? Okay, okay. so we'll start with the Centellans to give you guys a break and then we can hit the Hurleys and Salyers and then we'll close up. Um, okay, so we have two children that are polar opposites on the temperament scale, um, very, very different personalities, but they're both very, very extroverted personalities as well. Um, I, so they make me work hard. Um, <laughs> so the question, how do we help children get along when they have such different temperaments and personalities? Um, I think, um, just constantly bringing the, them back to um, the virtue of righteousness and having a um, right relationship with their sibling. Um, and in the zero to five range, again, it's a lot of um, role play and acting out. Well, oh, this is how we treat our sibling. This is how we show kindness to our sibling. Um, and I think, um, one of the things that uh, has really helped us was actually at family camp when uh, we did that big lesson about just accepting one another um, and not um, passing judgment on one another. Um, and I know zero to five, like that concept is for the kids, but um, just something that we've done in our house is like we will lift up and praise and highlight um, each of our kids different strengths and um, just really help them to understand that everyone is going to be different and everyone's going to like different things. Um, I know our kids struggle a lot with, they have very different interests and one kid wants the other one to play this thing with them. But for the other kid, it's kind of like torture. Um, specifically, one is very into monopoly and the other one, doesn't want to count anything and would rather get hit by a bus. So getting them to kind of understand, like, it's okay that we're different and that we like different things, but first and foremost, we're going to treat each other uh, with love and we're going to treat each other with kindness. And, and I think the other thing is one thing our older child has to realize is his little sister isn't going to be able to do everything he can do. And so acknowledging that you know that's that's above her level but mommy and daddy would love to do that because i think that's where a lot of conflict comes in play where he's like well she why can't she do this and it's like well she's two and a half years younger than you that just it's not doable so just reminding them of the age difference and different responsibility different um levels of maturity so um yeah i just want to add that you in Bree already touched on this. We can't allow them to be together if they yet don't know how to handle being together. Right. That's a freedom they have to earn. So just letting them have endless amount of time together when they don't know and respect each other's differences is going to end in conflict. So. Mike and Lisa, did you guys have anything you wanted to say on this? Yeah, guarantee what, what Tammy was saying here. So a lot of you have um, babies under two, and I'm sure that there are more. And then I don't know all the families, but I do see some with um, like early elementary aged group. And so you're, you're watching, that's you right now. Your goal and purpose in your home is to be the best observers of your babies and your, kid, your kids. 
babies, their personalities and temperaments are emerging. And some of it's delightful and some of it is terrifying or terrorizing, right? So your job right now, watch them, learn them <laughs> without judgment, right? Um, the ones with the siblings, the multiple children in the home, at, at, you're still watching them, but sometimes you're reffing them, right? You're trying to figure out, well, you don't, you don't have the freedom to just be together without extra guidance or extra coaching. So you're regulating and watching, but it's a, it's, I just keep saying, Rome, you can't build a whole city in a day, and you certainly can't build um, children who have harmony all the time in a day. So go easy on yourselves and build your community here so you can call somebody in your crazy moments to go, I don't know what I'm doing, and then keep continuing to learn and let God mold you to become more graceful, patient, um, temperate parents. So that's it. Um, Salyers, an anything briefly you guys wanted to add before we close up? We need acknowledgement. No. Sorry, I didn't. I looked away from the screen. Are you good? Okay. Okay. I. So you're gonna mention. Um. Okay. So I I oh, really so want to adhere to our time because I really want you guys to come back. So uh, so here's the thing. We made it through most of our questions. If we didn't answer your question, we will get back to you in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, yeah, sorry, we but didn't get this, to them in the chat. So I, uh, our goal is to do this every month and just to have continuing questions. If you need help in the interim, please reach out. But we really want to, um, like Lisa has said a few times, we want to create a community where you guys know that you're not alone. You're parenting through this stage with help. Um, there's people uh, who've already been there and have done great. Uh, so, you know, just hang in there. Um, Lisa's uh, uh, statement that you don't build Rome in a day is so true, right? God gives us 18 years with these children pretty much in our homes mm -hmm. Because he knows that it's going to take repetition and living life with them. Um, so yeah, you're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days, but do not give up because um, you will reap a harvest uh, when the time is right. So thank you guys for joining us. We really appreciate your sacrifice of time. Um, we love you guys. And thank you for the families okay. who participated by um, answering questions. We really love and appreciate you guys. Oh, You're geez. such great models. So all right, guys, Thank have a wonderful you. evening. Love you guys. Yeah.